Welcome to the third video of the third chapter. As you may have noticed in the last video, I left out a pretty important part of this whole process. We didn't talk at all about how the actual neurotransmitters work. How does that signal go from one neuron to the next? So in this video, we're going to talk a lot more about that process. So just to kind of give you the sequence of events. Um, first, the action potential travels down the axon um, and it gets to the axon terminal, which again, we talked about this has different different names, uh, terminal bouton, some axon terminal, different names, okay. So it gets to the axon terminal. When the signal gets to the axon terminal, it causes voltage-gated calcium channels, that's an important thing to know, calcium channels to open, and calcium ions enter the cell. Um, this results in synaptic vesicles fusing with the membrane, releasing neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitters then bind to postsynaptic receptors and cause either excitatory or inhibitory potentials. These excitatory or inhibitory postsynaptic potentials then spread towards the postsynaptic axon helix. So this is in the NETS neuron that receives the signal. Um, the transmitter then, the neurotransmitter, is inactivated or removed. So we'll talk about the different ways that happens because a lot of medications that you'll know of um, are effective in changing that process. And then the transmitter may um, also actually activate these things that are called presynaptic autoreceptors that can decrease release. We'll talk about these. These are, in a way, kind of the exceptions to the rule. But essentially, how does the cell that's releasing the neurotransmitters know when there's enough neurotransmitter that's in the, in the synapse? Well, it actually has some receptors too. And so it can detect how many neurotransmitters are in the synapse and can slow it down as needed. So an action potential again causes the calcium channels to open um, in the axon terminal and will allow calcium into the cell. The calcium causes these synaptic vesicles here. So calcium opens, so the calcium comes in. Synaptic vesicles merge with this um, cell wall here um, with the membrane and release the neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. Then you have the receptors here that we'll talk about how this works, but that receive the neurotransmitter and sense that. And you also have some um, receptors on the presynaptic side that de help determine when this process has happened enough and when to shut down the process. So also I wanted to mention a um, another process that's important for you to know about, um, pinocytosis. So this is P-I-N-O-C-Y-T-O-S-I-S. So pinocytosis is the creation of new vesicles after intense activity. So say for whatever reason you have this neuron just firing like crazy. Well, it actually can't go on forever. Eventually you run out of neurotransmitter and you run out of these vesicles. So the process of treating neurotransmitters is actually governed by an enzyme that incurs, that is inside the cell body. And because of this, it takes a while for the new synaptic vesicles to work their way down because it's up in the main cell body. This new vesicles have to come down. So it takes a while for them to get to the terminal button. Um, so if a neuron is firing at a higher rate than it can keep up with producing um, and transporting neurotransmitters, it may fatigue and become less effective at affecting its target. So neurotransmitters work very much like a key in a lock. If the neurotransmitter is the right size, it can fit in and activate the receptor. So a ligand is a substance or neurotransmitter that binds to a receptor on a dendrite. 
That's all it is. So something that binds to a receptor on the dendrite. They can do one of two things. They can either activate that receptor, so it's like turning the key, or they can block it. So this is like, you know, putting gum in the keyhole or something like this. So with this um, antipsychotic medications, one of the ways that they can work is they actually connect with those dopamine receptors and they block them. They just sit on them, blocking the dopamine so they can't connect and be sensed. So that's one way you can reduce the effectiveness of, um, of a neurotransmitter is by blocking that receptor. So there are two main types of ligands you'll need to know about. The first are endogenous ligands. These are ligands that are created within your body. So for instance, neurotransmitters, um, hormones can be, the, th the things that are natural to you are endogenous ligands. Exogenous ligands are drugs or toxins or chemicals that come from outside the body, but they still interact with the receptors. So as I mentioned previously, anything that's psychoactive either binds to a receptor or it affects a receptor in some way. These are examples of exogenous ligands, at least the ones that connect are. So for instance, since we're at a university, um, alcohol. Alcohol is an exogenous ligand. It actually binds with many different receptors, but one of them, one of them is GABA. Um, as you'll learn, GABA is one of the main inhibitory neurotransmitters. So this helps explain why alcohol, alcohol can have a inhibitory effect in the body because it's um, causing more GABA activation because it's able, it's an exogenous legend. It's able to connect with those receptors and activate them. So to give another example, let's discuss acetylcholine. If acetylcholine is used um, by the presynaptic axon, there will also be a receptor molecule for it on the postsynaptic dendrite. Acetylcholine is a tricky neurotransmitter because it can actually be either excitatory or inhibitory depending where it is. If it's excitatory, it'll open up channels for potassium or sodium depolarizing the cell, making it more likely that the cell will fire. On the other hand, if it's inhibitory, it will open chloride ch channels, causing it to hyperpolarize. So although the cell is already natively charged, the chloride will come in because of the concentration gradient. So again, that's where those two forces come into play. So it brings these chloride in, even though the cell is negative and it's negative, and it makes the cell even more natively charged, making it harder for natural potential to occur because it's harder to depolarize the cell to that negative 40 millivolts. Also, as we mentioned earlier, drugs and toxins can be um, exog exogenous ligands, meaning that they come from the outside of the body, or outside the body, I should say, um, but they can still connect and interact with neurotransmitter receptors. Uh, a couple examples of this, um, toxins terrari and bundelotoxin, both of these block cholinergic receptors, meaning acetylcholine receptors. And by doing this, we call them antagonists. So an antagonist is something that reduces the effectiveness of something else, in this case, acetylcholine. So they would be acetylcholine antagonists. Um, so with that, in this case, the toxins actually bind with the receptors and it leaves the acetylcholine no place to bind on the postsynaptic dendrite. With no place to go, they can't have an effect. So it's an antagonist because it reduces the effect, reduces the effectiveness of the acetylcholine. There are also agonists. Agonists are molecules that increase the effectiveness or the effect of a neurotransmitter. The example the book gives is um, mustarine, which can be found in mushrooms and also um, nicotine. Both of these mimic acetylcholine very closely and so closely that they can bind and activate some of the cholinergic receptors. So this causes a similar effect to acetylcholine. So by adding these chemicals, it increases the effect of acetylcholine. So these are acetylcholine agonists. 
Um, there are also other drugs that are agonists. Um, antidepressants are a really good example, and we'll talk more about this um, in class. But briefly, let's talk about SSRIs. Those are the most common antidepressants you see now. SSRIs are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, meaning that they block the serotonin um, neurotransmitters that are in the synapse from being sucked back up into the presynaptic cell. So by keeping them in that um, synapse longer, it makes it so they have more time, more chances to connect and make a difference on the postsynaptic cell. So that magnifies, it increases the effect of the antidepressant, or of serotonin, sorry, of serotonin. So it's a serotonin agonist that's increasing the effect of serotonin. Um, one thing that's very interesting, I think at least, is the number of receptors in cells vary greatly, even day to day. These things change all the time, and they change um, regularly during adulthood, both just normally with development, but also with drug use. So you can see either upregulation or downregulation. Upregulation is an increase in the number of receptors, and downregulation is a decrease in the number of receptors. So this is part of the reason you can see their sensitivity or tolerance to a medication, because you can have either an increase in the receptors or a decrease as a result of the drug use, which is one of the many reasons you can see those. So you have a neurotransmitter that binds to a receptor. What happens next? Well, it depends on the type of the receptor. There are two primary types, ionotropic and metabotropic. Ionotropic receptors are the fastest and simplest. When a molecule binds to the receptor, the ion channel opens in response. Very simple. Binds, opens. Metabotropic receptors are a bit more, a bit slower and a bit more complicated. Here, the receptor does not directly control the ion channel, but may, when activated, use a G protein to alter the functioning of the cell. So a G protein is a protein that's able to bind to um, GDP, GTP, or guanine neurotides, or nucleotides rather. Don't worry about these names, you don't need to know them. But what you need to know is um, a G protein, or what's called a first messenger, um, sometimes will open channels or may activate another chemical that affects the ion channels. So the chemical um, that it would activate is known as a second messenger. It amplifies the effects of the G protein and may lead to changes in the membrane potential. So thus for metabotropic, think of it as a small game of telephone in order to get the desired result. So with the ionotropic, as soon as it, as soon as it connects, it opens. So very simple, connect, open, done. So, sorry, that's this one over here. So, as, long, as soon as it connects, opens. For metabotropic, neurotransmitter connects, it sends off one of these G proteins, and either directly or through such a messenger, it causes a ion channel to change its functioning in some way, and that's how they have their effect. As you can imagine, if a cell can fire up to 12,000 times per second, Neurotransmitters will need to only act for a short period of time and then be cleared out for the next message to get through. So this clearing out is typically done either through degradation or reuptake. In degradation, the neurotransmitter is quickly broken down into inactive units by an enzyme. Uh, the book gives an example of acetylcholine being broken down by acetylcholinesterase, and it gets broken down into choline and acetic acid. Um, another good example, I think, um, because you hear of them sometimes, are monoamine oxidase, um, which this is the enzyme that breaks down serotonin. So I don't know how many of you have heard of um, MAOIs. You probably have heard of them in ads for drugs, where they talk about it, you know, if you're on an MAOI, you have to do certain precautions. We'll talk about why that is later. but. 
so again, monoamine oxidase is the enzyme that breaks down serotonin. So one way to increase the amount of serotonin in the brain is to stop this enzyme, to prevent this enzyme from working. So what an MAOI does, uh, MAOI actually stands for monoamine oxidase inhibitor. So it actually inhibits the monoamine oxidase enzyme, and since the serotonin doesn't get broken down as quickly, it can have its effect longer. So that's one way you can affect it is by affecting degradation. Um, you also have reuptake, and as I mentioned here, with reuptake, the neurotransmitter gets sucked back up into the presynaptic cell, and SSRIs are one type of medication that blocks this process, and by blocking this process, it makes it so the serotonin has a longer effect in the synapse. So both of these work the same way. Both MAOIs and SSRIs both work to increase the amount of time serotonin in the synapse. They just do so through different mechanisms. Um, and as I mentioned, um, there's also the process called um, pinocytosis, which is the process of repackaging neurotransmitters into vesicles so that they can be used again. So think of this as recycling. Um, where you have this repackaging. And um, transporters also play a vital role in the process. They are specialized receptors on the presynaptic axon that recognize the neurotransmitter and returns it into the presynaptic neuron for reuse. On this slide, we're going to talk about exceptions to the rule as far as how neurons communicate. Before I even begin this, I should preface it by saying that none of what's on this slide is on your quiz. I think it's important to touch on so you know that there are exceptions to the rule, but I want you to know just how it normally works. That's what you'll be tested on. So don't let this information interfere with the things we've talked about already. So to this point, we focus on traditional axodendrite or axosomatic um, synapses. So axodendrite, or dendritic, I should say, um, means that the synapse consists of an axon terminal which synapses with a dendrite or a dendritic spine of another, um, of another cell. Axosomatic means that the axon creates a synapse with the cell body of a postsynaptic neuron. However, there are many non-traditional synapses that you also see through the, throughout the nervous system. For instance, there are actually axo-axonic connections, which are two connections, or two axons connecting. And there are also dendrodendritic ads, or connections, which is a synapse between two dendrites. Anyway, I won't spend any more time on these. They're in the book if you're curious. They aren't on your quiz. The take-home message is that there are other types of connections in the nervous system. I just don't want you to have to worry about them. But I just want you to be aware that they exist.